This is a reading from the Virgin Mary in the writings of Mary Voltorta by Father Gabriel M. Roshini, O.S.M. Mother of Good Counsel It is only natural for mothers to give advice to their children. Mary has always done so. Jesus is speaking to a group of women disciples. My mother will be with you now, and with her will remain the wisdom of all her virtues. As from now, you may follow all her advice. Follow her word. It is the same as mine, but made sweeter. Nothing is to be added to it, because it is the word of the mother of wisdom. Poema 3, page 84 to 85. Listen, Azariah the angel says to the seer, she is singing in her pearly light. Blessed are those who walk along my ways. The ways of Mary lead to God's heart. Listen to my advice and become wise. Don't turn your ear away. Such a holy mother as she can speak only words of life. Think about it. She was already full of grace and therefore full of wisdom. Then she bore the word in her womb for nine months, and the word found his rest on her bosom from the day he was born through his childhood and even when he died. How much grace did he leave in her after spending 33 years so close to her heart? God the Son, who never remains passive, even towards the guilty, never remained passive towards his lovable mother. That is why all his wisdom was united to all her purity. And Mary can speak but the word of God, the very word which Christ said was life for those who listened to it. Azariah, page 345. When Gamaliel the famous rabbi became old and blind, he sought the light. He sought advice from Mary, the seed of wisdom, begging her to obtain for him not bodily vision, but the sight of an eagle, to enable his spirit to see the whole truth, so as to see Jesus and love him with his whole being. The Blessed Virgin, seeing that he was rather depressed, tried to encourage him in every way. Gamaliel, can you believe that I am the seed of wisdom and the full of grace? that wisdom took flesh in me, that because I am full of grace, grace gave me the fullness of supernatural knowledge? Do you believe I can give you sound advice? Oh, yes, I believe, Gamaliel replies. It is precisely because I believe that, that I have come to you to obtain the light. I am so aware of my errors, so crushed by my spiritual misery, that I need help to dare to go to God. You think that's an obstacle? The mother of good counsel replies. On the contrary, it is a wing that will make you soar towards God. You have demolished yourself. You have humbled yourself. You used to be a powerful mountain, Gamaliel, and have made yourself a deep valley. Learn that humility is like fertilizer, preparing the most infertile land to produce many plants, even bumper crops. It is a step on which one can climb. Actually, it is a staircase that ascends to God. When God sees a humble person, he calls him to himself to glorify him and set him on fire with the fire of his charity and illumine him with his lights so that he can see. That is why I tell you that you are already in the light, on the way of justice, on your way to the true life of the children of God. Gamaliel addresses John, Now that Mary's words and your words have comforted me, I want to enter the Master's sheepfold immediately before my old heart broken by many things, takes its final rest. Mary spontaneously embraces him and says to him, May God grant you peace. May God always be with you. May God give you his blessing. Gamaliel, who is blind, again gropes for Mary's hands. He takes them into his own, kisses them, and kneeling down, begs her to impose her blessed hands on his old, tired head. Mary contents him. Then she helps him to stand up. Humanly speaking, Gamaliel is a worn-out man. He is finished, but from the supernatural point of view, he is reborn. Poema 10, page 316 to 318. Health of the Sick Il Poema del Uomo Dio calls the Blessed Virgin healthy cure of sick people. Poema 3, page 84. One day, in the second year of his public ministry, Jesus was in Judas' house in Kerioth. Judas drew his attention to a lame man who wished to be healed. Since it was not possible to carry him over, he urged Jesus to come along with him to see the man. Jesus answered, Tomorrow, Judas, tomorrow morning, definitely, 
and if there are more sick people, tell me or bring them here. At this time, the Virgin Mary and Simon Peter came in. Mary greeted Jesus, and then Judas' mother, who had bowed low. Mary lifted her up and embraced her, as if she was a dear friend she had not seen in a long time. Our Lady was arriving from Bethsur, where she had been with Jesus a few days before vis to visit Eliza, a widow. Eliza was a former companion of Mary's at the temple. Her two children had died, which plunged Eliza into a deep desolation. She had withdrawn into her room in profound despair. Jesus comforted her and left his mother with her for a few days. Poema 3, page 472 to 482. Mary's affectionate presence gave life and vigor to this wilted flower. Mary then left Eliza and met with her son in Judas' Judas's house in Kerioth. Handing him a little scroll, she said, Here, son, Eliza's greetings. Jesus unfolds it and reads it, then says, I knew. I was sure. Thank you, mother. On my behalf and on Eliza's, you really are the health of the sick. Ibid, page 519. On another occasion, Judas Iscariot was gravely ill and experienced Mary's affectionate motherly care. Later on, he said to Jesus that he never felt the desire for his mother, not even in the worst hours of his disease, because your mother was a real mother to me. She was kind and loving, and I will never forget it, he said. Poema 4, page 629. Mother of Orphans In the first year of his public ministry, while visiting his mother in her home in Nazareth, Jesus brought her to orphans, shepherd helpers from Bethlehem. O oh, mother, I found the shepherds of Bethlehem, and I brought you two of them. They are orphans, and you are the mother of all men, and more so of orphans. Poema 2, page 318. The next day he entrusted them to her, saying, Here are two sons looking for a mother. Be their joy, woman. You are welcome. Mary explains, You, Levi, you, I do not know. But according to your age, as he told me, you must be, Joseph. The name is sweet and sacred in his house. Come, come, it is with joy that I say to you, my house welcomes you, and a mother embraces you. The shepherds seem spellbound. They are so enraptured. Poema 2, page 323. Mary's encounter with Yabe, a little orphan, is moving. Jesus took this little boy along and brought him from the Mount of Olives to Bethany, holding him by the hand. When they arrived, Jesus let go of the child's hand and ran to greet Mary. Yabe felt left alone. He looks, then bends his head, endeavors to restrain his tears, but he cannot and bursts out weeping, moaning, Mommy! Mommy! But before Yabe can catch his breath and speak while shedding so many tears, Mary has run towards him and takes him in her hand, in her arms, saying, Yes, my little child. Your mother, do not cry any more, and excuse me if I did not see you before. My friends, here is my little son. It is obvious this, that Jesus, in the few seconds while approaching the boy, must have said to her, He is a little orphan I brought with me. Mary realized the rest. The boy is still weeping, but not so disconsolately. And as Mary is holding him in her arms and kissing him, he ends up by smiling, while his face is still wet with tears. Let me try those tears of yours, Mary says to him. You must not cry any more. Give me a kiss. Yabe was expecting nothing but that, and after being caressed by bearded men, he is overjoyed in kissing Mary's smooth cheek. Poema 3, page 381. Mary gave the child the name Margium, later shortened to Marzium. Ibid 391. This was a name of love and of salvation. Ibid 385. It meant little drop in the sea of those saved by Jesus, Ibid 385. Later she intervened to have him entrusted to Peter and his wife Porphyria, Ibid 398-400, footnote 126. See the account of Mary's intervention on page 203, editor. He eventually became a fervent disciple and preached the gospel of Jesus. Comfort of the Afflicted Mary speaking, I cannot bear to see anybody suffer. Poema 4, page 765. She could not even bear looking at the slaughter of a lamb because she would think about his mother's heartbreak. It tears my heart to see a mother tortured, she says to the shepherds of Bethlehem of Galilee. But woman, if all the lambs were to live, there would be no room for us on the earth, says the oldest shepherd. I know, but I am thinking of their pain and the pain of their mothers, 
They weep so much when their little ones are taken away from them. They look like real mothers, like us. A mother's grief is different from any other, because the shock for the loss of a son tears not only our hearts and brains, but our very wombs. We mothers are always united to our sons, and it rends us completely when they are taken away from us. Ibid. At that precise moment a small detachment of soldiers passed by, entering Bethlehem of Galilee to take a son from his mother. They wanted to put him to death on the calumnious charge of killing a rich man by the name of Joel. Hearing about this, Jesus says, I see. Let us go, my friends. You women stay here with the shepherds. I shall be back soon. No, son, Mary says to Jesus, I am coming with you. Jesus is already walking fast towards the center of the town. The woman is still contending for her son with the guards. Leave him! Murderers! He's innocent! That the night Joel was killed, he was in bed beside me! The guards, however, wrench her son away from her, and the poor woman falls on the ground, swooning. Jesus stops before the group of captors. Stop for one moment. I order you. His countenance allows no objection. Ibid, page 766-68. to He vigorously attacks the witness's false testimony. Meanwhile, the Blessed Virgin and Mary of Alphaeus help the unconscious mother. The accused swears he is innocent. The accusers commit perjury. Suddenly, the accused and the accusers scream out at the same time. The accused, a scream of surprise. The accuser, a cry of horror. The accuser's faces were instantly covered with horrible leprosy, while the accused remained healthy. Jesus takes the young man by the hand and leads him away from the lepers. Everyone else, including the soldiers, move away. Jesus orders the young man to go back to his mother. After a brief, after a brief speech to the lepers and to the other people, Jesus joins his mother and Mary of Clopas, who are still attending to the woman, slowly coming to. The poor mother gazes at the loving countenance of Mary, comfort of the afflicted, and recovers her strength. Her son pats her cold hands and kisses them. After expressing motherly concern for her vindicated son, she takes Jesus' hand, kissing and wetting it with tears. She then says to him, My son's life and mine are yours, because you have saved them. Jesus replies to her, You will follow your son and me. Be happy. Poema 4, page 768-71 to It would be difficult not to conclude this insight into Mary's universal motherhood without exclaiming, along with Jesus, the firstborn among many brothers. How motherly you are! You are the mother! Poema 5, page 429 Mary, Queen of the Church We have seen that Mary is the mother of the Church. As mother of the mystical body of Christ, she communicates supernatural life to all its members. She does so with Christ, while being subordinated to Him, as the neck is subordinated to the head. In the same way, with Christ and under Christ, Mary also exerts true dominion over all the members of the Church. Thus, Mary is the Queen of the Church. Since the Church is the Kingdom of Christ, it is also Mary's. God, speaking to the angels and saints of heaven, immediately after Our Lady's assumption, For her I open the treasures of heaven. For her head, which never yielded to pride, I fashion with my own splendor a wreath and crown, her as your queen, because for she, for me she is most holy. Poem 10, page 357. Our Lady commented God's words. When God finished speaking, the spirits of heaven shone for joy since it was impossible for these spirits to shed tears in response to the exuberance welling up inside of them, they instead sparkled with light. Heaven witnessed splendid colors being brightened into even more spectacular colors. The flaming fire of charity was fanned into an even greater blaze, while heavenly choirs resounded in their incomparable and indescribable harmonies. My son's voice joined them in praising God the Father and blessing his handmaid, who would be eternally happy. Ibid. Maria Voltora's writings exalt Mary both as Queen of the Church in its entireness, as Raya, page 108, and as Queen of various categories of persons, Queen of the Angels, 
Queen of the Apostles, Queen of Virgins, etc. Mary, Queen of Humanity. Mary is the queen of every creature. Ibid, page 336. The following text reminds one of the Hail Holy Queen. Jesus told his mother that innocent creatures would not be the only ones coming to her. Lepers, horrors, stench, a tangle of snakes, and foul things will creep to your feet, O Queen of Mankind, and will shout, Have mercy, succor us, take us to your Son. Poema 3, page 84. On the night Jesus was born, the shepherds of Bethlehem prostrated themselves before Mary and said, Give us orders as our queen, because we will be happy to serve you. What can we do for you? Poema 1, page 203. The most elect part of the human race consists in the blessed, in heaven. That is why God calls Mary queen of my paradise. Poema 1, page 34. The reason for this? Mary is the queen mother, the mother of the king of kings. Quaderni 43, page 590, November 27th. Mary, Queen of Various Categories of Persons Our Lady is proclaimed the Queen of Angels, Queen of Apostles, Queen of Virgins, Queen of Angels. In several passages, Maria Voltorta calls Mary Queen of the Angels, Azariah, page 108, 336, etc. Several times, angels call her Our Queen, Ibid, page 262, 63, and 341. Shortly before her glorious assumption to heaven, our Lady, as though remembering that she was the Queen of Angels, spoke at length about them with John the Apostle. Everything is so peaceful. You too, be at peace. Everything is quiet, except for the olive trees, but their rustling is so light that it sounds like angels hovering about the house. Perhaps some angels are really here. After all, there has always been at least one angel close to me at key times in my life. They were with me in Nazareth when the Spirit of God made my virginal womb bear life. Angels were at Joseph's side when he was troubled and did not know what to do with me when he found out I was with child. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 25. In Bethlehem, angels came to us when Jesus was born. Luke chapter 2, verse 9 to 15. And when we had to flee to Egypt, Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. They came in Egypt too, ordering us to go back to Palestine. Matthew chapter 2, verses 19 to 20. Jesus appeared to me as soon as he rose from the dead. Since he is the king of the angels, no angel needed appear to me on that occasion. Angels appealed, appeared to the pious women instead. It was dawn on the first day after the Sabbath. Matthew chapter 8, 28, verses 1 to 7. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 8. John chapter 20, verses 12 to 13. The angels ordered the women to tell you and Peter what to do. Yes, angels and light have always been provided at key times in my life and Jesus' life. Light, as well as fiery love, would come down from God's throne to me, his handmaid. Light and love would surge out of my heart and soar up to God, my King and my Lord. Fiery love and light would unite me to God and God to me. Because of this unity, all the scriptures that had to be fulfilled came to be fulfilled. Also, Light was spread out as a curtain to shield God's secrets from Satan and his slaves. In this way, the enemy would not find out until the time was ripe that the sublime mystery of the Incarnation had been accomplished. I can't see any angels tonight, but I feel them around me, and I can feel in me, inside of me, a growing light. It is an unbearable light, like the light that surrounded me when I conceived the Christ, when I gave him to the world. It is coming from a throb of love stronger than my usual. With a similar surge of love, I was able to obtain the word from heaven before the appointed time, so that he would become the man and redeemer. With a similar surge of love, like the one uplifting me tonight, heaven will hopefully ravish me and take me in my spirit to the place I pine for. There I could sing forever with the multitude of saints and the choirs of angels, I could sing my imperishable Magnificat, Luke chapter 1, 46-55, to God for the great things he has done for me, his handmaid. Poema 10, page 334-35. In the previous text, we have a host of angels hovering close to their queen. 
and the humble house in Nazareth. However, it was only the archangel who venerated his queen. Poema 3, page 73. Queen of the Apostles After Christ's resurrection, especially on Pentecost Day, all the apostles considered Mary as their queen. Immediately after, Matthias was elected to replace Judas as an apostle. The other apostles took him to Mary, who was deep in prayer in her room. They wanted the new apostle to receive the word of salvation and election from the Mother of God. Poem 10, page 263. They also wanted him to pay homage to the Queen of the Apostles. Azariah, page 51, 108 and 111. Mary's dignity as Queen of the Apostles is particularly evident on Pentecost Day, when the Holy Spirit made his descent. Only the twelve, under Mary's direction, Ibid, page 158, are in the Eucharist room. Footnote 127. See note 96 on page 159, translator. The windows are closed and barred. The Virgin Mary is the only one sitting on a seat. Peter is sitting on a table couch on her right, and John on her left. Matthias, the new apostle, is sitting between Thaddeus and James of Alphaeus. In front of Mary, there lies a wide, low chest made of dark wood. It is closed. Mary is wearing dark blue clothing. Under the tip of her coat, a white veil covers her hair. The others are bareheaded. Mary is reading slowly, out loud, from a scroll that she is holding open. The others meditate as they listen quietly. Once in a while, they reply when it is called for. Footnote 128. Mary, mother of the church, is leading the apostles in prayer. There is reading and listening, reciting and meditating, with active participation. Father Berti's note in the Italian critical edition. Volume 10, page 265, note 5. Mary's face is transfigured by an ecstatic smile. Who knows what she can see that makes her eyes gleam like two bright stars, and her cheeks, normally the color of ivory, blush as if she was reflecting a pink flame. She is really the mystical rose. With her heads, with her head, their heads turned slightly, the apostles lean forward to look at her face. Meanwhile, she goes on reading with a soft smile. Her voice is like the song of an angel. Peter is so moved that two big tears roll along the deep creases on both sides of his nose until they are lost in his bushy, grayish beard. John smiles like the Virgin Mary. Like her, he is set ablaze with love. His eyes follow the words that she is reading on the scroll. When he gives her another scroll, he looks at her and smiles. Mary has ceased speaking. The reading is finished. Once the scrolls of parchment are re-rolled and no longer rustle, Mary begins to pray in secret. She joins her hands on her bosom and leans her head on the closed chest. The apostles imitate her. The morning's quiet is suddenly shattered by a mighty, harmonious rumble that reminds one at once of the wind and the harp, human singing, and the boom of a perfect organ. As it draws near, it sounds louder and even more harmonious. It fills the ground with its vibrations, which spread to the house, to the walls and objects. The candelabra's chains tinkle as they sway because of the supernatural sound that flows by them. The flame, which had been still until then, until then, in the closed, peaceful room, trembles as if there was wind. The apostles, frightened, lift their heads. The mighty sound, very beautiful, contains all the nicest notes that God gave to heaven and earth. As it draws nearer, however, some of the apostles stand up, ready to run away. Others huddle on the ground, covering their heads with their hands and coats, or beating their chests and asking the Lord for forgiveness. Yet others huddle next to Mary, the most pure. They are too scared to keep at a distance from her, as they usually do. John is the only one who is not scared, since he sees Mary's face beaming with great joy and luminous peace. Mary lifts up her head, smiling at something she alone can see. Smoothly going to her knees, she opens her arms. The two blue wings of her open coat covered Peter and John, who, like her, have knelt. I have taken a few minutes to describe all this but it happened in less than one. Now, although the room is closed, all the doors and windows are shut. The light, the blaze, the Holy Spirit enters with one last thunderous, melodious crash. He appears in the shape of an extremely brilliant globe, blazing all around. When Mary sees the fiery paraclete, she raises her arms so as to invoke him. 
Her, fa her veil slips off so as she lifts her head straight up with a shout of joy and a smile, expressing her boundless love. The Holy Spirit, in full blaze, hovers about three hand-widths over Mary's uncovered head. For a short while, the fullness of the Holy Spirit's love rests above his spouse. After a moment, the most holy globe separates into thirteen dazzling, dancing flames. Footnote 129. It is perhaps significant that Maria Voltorta says that all the fire of the divine paraclete condensed itself and stopped over his spouse's virginal head, and there divided itself into thirteen flames. This passage illustrates God's conjugal love for the Blessed Virgin and hers for her Lord, as well as the office and power of the Mediatrix, who called and attracted on earth the Holy Spirit and merited its most fruitful descent. Father Berti's Annotation in the Italian Critical Edition, Volume 10, page 266, Note 12. No light on earth compares with theirs. Twelve of the flames descend, descend as a kiss, one on each apostle's forehead. The thirteenth flame, however, does not alight on Mary as a tongue of fire kissing her on the forehead. Instead, a fiery wreath encircles her virginal head like a flaming crown. The daughter, mother, and spouse of God, the incorruptible virgin, the most beautiful, the eternal child, the one who had been loved from eternity, is crowned as a queen. Nothing can vilify her in any way. Grief had aged her, but the joy of the resurrection rejuvenated her. Together with her son, she now enjoys increased beauty, while her flesh, gaze, and vitality have been renewed. Her beauty at Pentecost is already a pledge of the beauty of her glorious body, which would be taken to heaven to be the flower of paradise. The Holy Spirit makes his flames sparkle around his beloved's head. What words is he whispering to her? It remains a mystery. Her face is transfigured with supernatural joy. Her smile is like the smile of the seraphim. Diamonds seem to be tumbling down the cheeks of the most blessed woman as the light of the Holy Spirit shines on her tears of joy. The blaze remains as a crown on Mary's head for some time. Then it disappears. A fragrance is left behind, such as no earthly flower can distill. It is a perfume from paradise. The apostles come back to their senses. Mary, however, remains in ecstasy. Only she folds her, arm on her, her arms on her chest, closes her eyes, and bows her head. She pursues her dialogue with God. She is unaware of what is going on around her. No one dares bother her. John points at her, saying, She is the altar. On her glory, the glory of the Lord has descended. That is true. Let's not rob her of her joy. Let's go preach about the Lord instead. May his words be manifested among the nations. Peter is speaking with a supernatural impulse. Let's go. Let's go. The Spirit of God is burning inside of me, James of Alphaeus cries out. He's urging us all to do something. Let's go evangelize the world. They storm out as if they were pushed or drawn by a violent wind or some force. Poema 10, page 264-68 to Since the apostles and their successors have a complete share of the priesthood, it is not without grounds that Jesus deigned to give Our Lady the title Queen of the Priesthood. I'll read this one next time.